Hey everyone for, well, the final time here on YouTube here in International Organization. This is um, our concluding lecture, um, our final recap of the course, and uh, one that seeks to incorporate the last two chapters of KMS. Now I realize that uh, we need to look at the role of the environment as a transnational challenger to the international system. But I also wanted to provide some time for us to wrap up the course, recap some of the main points, and start preparing for that final paper that's due in about two weeks or so. So this lecture may be a little bit longer than normal. Um, I don't know how long it may go, but um, it's quite extensive. But I figured, you know what? This is the final recap, and many of you will probably be reaching for this lecture, I would say more than once, uh, between now and the final paper submission. So I feel that looking at the environment is a great way of not just recapping some of the things that we've known about theories of international organization, but kind of using it as a way of gauging where we go from here, right? I mean, we are recording this, I'm, I'm recording this lecture, um, really on the eve of 2021. It has been anything but a boring year um, with everything that has happened, and especially in light of COVID, just kind of providing a chain reaction of maladies and afflictions economically, politically, socially around the world. You know, it stands to reason to hypothesize that environmental challenges will do just that. So I figured that Rather than separating these two things, talking about the environment and then wrapping the course up, using the environment and using the transnational problems that the environment and climate change and all of the challenges that are created by this um, can be you know, looked at is a great way to examine uh, whether or not we really need um, an expanded, reformed, and you know, deeply entrenched international order in an increasingly globalizing and multilateral world. So the rundown of this lecture is really threefold, right? There's three big things, three, um, you know, three big objectives that I want to focus on um, in the next hour or so. The first is taking stock of the international system here at the end of, you know, 2020. <clears throat> um, we have um, had this class during the presidential election, the um, you know the defeat of Donald Trump, the imminent um, you know transition uh, to Joe Biden, but looking at the world, and while this isn't a class in international relations or world politics, um, it's enough to say that the liberal democratic system around the world, the one that seemed poised to offer such optimism and such hope for growth about 30 years ago with the end of the Cold War, really seems to be cornered, beleaguered, um, under attack by a number of emerging illiberal democratic, quasi-authoritarian, national populist movements around the world. Um, Donald Trump is certainly not the harbinger of this um, illiberal democratic system, and nor is his defeat really the end of it. Um, I would even go so far as to say that if uh, mismanaged um, enough, a Biden administration may elicit um, a backlash, a Republican backlash in two years in the midterm elections, especially with Republicans likely to take control of the House. And who knows um, what they might throw up as an opposition figure to either him or Kamala um, in 2024. So the noted weakening of liberal democratic systems, especially in light of the rise of countries like China and Russia, um, certainly make the world um, a bit less optimistic than uh, we, you know, you know, had we possessed uh, back in the 1990s. The other thing we need to look at is that the world, the the, the world of 2021, is really a world in which multipolarity is emerging. If it hasn't already gotten there. Our study of global affairs, and if this is really the end of your um, experience in international affairs or just the beginning, right? if you choose to uh, continue on with either myself or Dr. Fahmy or other um, scholars and academics within the international studies arena, you will be hard-pressed to deny that the world today is much more multilateral, much more multipolar. 
And that, of course, leaves us with uh, one of the big burning questions. What is the role of the United States? Um, what role will the U.S. play? What um, capabilities, what opportunities will um, someone like Joe Biden or just, you know, future American leaders have? Let, let, let's look even beyond Biden. Let's take a look at, let's say, future generations of political leaders, you know, people like, you know, AOC or Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, um, you know, where will the Bernie Sanders movement go? What is the future for um, national populism? Um, does neoliberalism have a future after uh, Biden's, you know, departure from politics? And will the United States be um, a primary power in the world or will it be playing catch up and just simply responding to actions taken by China Russia, Iran, and others. So it's a great way of rounding out the course and sort of taking stock of where we are um, at the end of a incredibly tumultuous year. The second thing, and this is really the last um, specific examination of something um, you know heavy in this class, is the challenges and uh, is, is the challenges of protecting the environment. And, you know, I will go off cue a couple of times in this lecture today to, um, you know, soapbox a little bit more than just simply um, give you information. I have my own opinions. I have my own assessments um, about the future of global security and the environment. And unfortunately, I have to say that, you know, if we are, if we continue the current trend, um, the future does not look all that great. Um, I am definitely um, someone who is an absolute advocate of, um, you know, radical and unconditional um, adjustment of the environment because all of our futures um, effectively depend on that. And I say that knowing um, the chain reaction that environmental damage and deterioration of the ecosystem creates in causing new problems and threats. So, you know, this is sort of the big thing about looking at the environment as a transnational problem is that, you know, it's, it's not so much climate change and it's not so much ice caps melting or sea levels rising, but it's the residual effects of what these things will do to the ecosystem what it will do to plant and animal life, what it will do in causing humans to migrate to safer areas, especially when, and I have to be perfectly honest here, the world is, in my opinion, overpopulating. Um, you know, I remember when I was in high school, and you know, that wasn't that long ago, we're talking about, you know, 25, 30 years ago, um, the, you know, the, the global population was somewhere around 4 billion and change. And today, in tw at the end of 2020, the global population is about 7 billion and change. So within a generation, the, you know, the world's population has nearly doubled. And while there are people who feel that it is entirely insensitive to say that the world is overpopulated, um, I have no problem saying that, look, if people will make the argument that, yeah, the world has enough space for everybody. But we tend to forget there's large parts of the planet that are uninhabitable for human existence. So, you know, when you cut out the uninhabitable areas, you're stuck with less than half of what's left. So can twice the world's population from 30 years ago um, sustain livable um, lives um, on less than half of the you know, world's geography? And what does that do? to the land? What does that do to the air, to the environment, to the plants, the trees, the animals? Um, you know, one can, you know, one need only look um, at the developing worlds of just India and China and realize that we've got some serious issues that we really should have dealt with a long time ago, but it is only becoming critically important front and center now. And even still, the people that are in power, um, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, seem to be of an earlier generation that feel that either A, the environment is not worth putting, um, you know, top grade priority to, B, gets in the way of economic progress, or C, and I hate to say this, is an issue that they don't have to worry about because they'll be dead in 10 years. 
So what do they really care about? What does Dianne Feinstein care about? She'll be dead in 10 years. What does Chuck Schumer or Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi think? They'll be dead in 10 years. What does it really matter? So, you know, it's really left to younger generations like you and I to deal with. And, you know, at a certain point, we reach a point of no return where we can't really rectify anything more, anything anymore. We can really just, you know, mitigate the damage. I'll get to that, you know, in due time. And finally, um, I feel like a really great way to round out this class is to question the future of the state, right, the, the sovereign state in an increasingly global and internationalizing world order. Um, the world is definitely becoming much more crowded and congested at the institutional level, I'm not just talking about population. I'm talking about organizations, institutions, both IGOs and NGOs. You know, when we take institutions into account, states are, well, they, they no longer enjoy, uh, you know, unchallenged practice at the international level. Um, that's not to say that the state is, you know, doomed to extinction. But there is, I think, a rather sobering reality that, International organizations are very good at pointing out problems in the world today, but they have an incredibly poor job doing anything about it. And, you know, at the risk of giving the plot away before the movie even begins, the role of the state is and will be critically important in addressing many of these transnational issues, including the environment. States will make or break the future international order. What are their powers and capabilities? in an increasingly internationalizing, institutionalizing environment? What are their limits and shortcomings? You know, not every state has the you know, power and capabilities of others, and even the most powerful countries, right? The Russias, the Chinas, the United States, is, they cannot solve all of the world's problems on their own. Um, but is there, let's say, a symbiotic relationship that states can have um, in working with both IGOs and NGOs in addressing truly, truly transnational issues. That's something that we will look at at the end of this lecture. So we got a lot of stuff. We got a lot of stuff to look at in this final lecture. I recommend you put on uh, a pot of coffee, you know, pour yourself a nice drink, um, whatever it is that you need to get yourself relaxed and involved in here because this is, this is the concluding lecture and this is us taking stock of where we are. And where are we? I mean, I am recording this, you know, the first week of December in 2020. It will be 2021 um, in a few short weeks. That is, of course, if 2020 doesn't fool us and December 31st just becomes December the 32nd, you know. But, um, you know, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, where is the world? Um, you know, right here, right now. First is, well, it takes us right back to something that I talked about I would say, as early as week one of this class. And that is the world, the international system, is marked by what many IR scholars would call lopsided multipolarity, right? Lopsided multipolarity in a post-American world. So congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You are entering adulthood um, in one of the most unpredictable, volatile, and I would even say insecure times in about a century, right? in about a century. Um, it has been decades um, since this level of uncertainty and, um, um, you know, decentralized power has you know, really defined the shape of the international system. Now, before I get all gloom and doom here, the United States is still a major world power. There is no question about that. And there is no question that the United States will remain a global power for the foreseeable future. And this would have been the case whether Donald Trump got reelected, you know, Joe Biden or anybody else, you know, Bernie Sanders, even, you know, <laughs> even Joe, Bo even, um, you know, what's his name? Uh, Pete Buttigieg, right? The United States will remain a global power for the foreseeable future. But as I have been emphasizing, the United States is no longer a global hegemon. A power is different from a hegemon. A power is a state that has the ability to exert influence and coerce other states to do things according to its own interest. A hegemon, on the other hand, is a power that is comparatively unassailable 
and has really no major challenger uh, to a region. Now, the United States enjoyed unipolar hegemony for much of the 1990s. And, you know, I would say certainly in the beginning of 2000, but starting with the 9-11 attacks and just sort of culminating in the, um, you know, the 2008 economic crisis, the United States is hegemony on world development, on global affairs, um, significantly deteriorated. Now, again, from just regular hardcore IR theory, this is nothing out of the ordinary. Unipolar powers do not exist longer than maybe 10 years, 15 at the most. The United States is now um, a participant in an emerging multipolar system, a system that we really have not experienced since, again, about 100 years ago. You know, I would say the interwar period between World War I and World War II was really the last stages of global multipolarism before the Second World War produced the bipolar system between the United States and the Soviet Union, which then gave way to, you know, uh, you know a few victory laps of American unipolarism before we go back to, you know, this type of five or six, um, you know, global power system. And, you know, look, the United States is still um, a major power, but it is challenged in almost every part of the world uh, by an additional power that either looks at the United States as a direct rival or a friendly competitor. You know, the United States has to kind of realize that not all of its rivals are antagonistic. But it's pretty clear in examining the world today, we see a reasserted Russia um, you know, exerting influence and foreign policy in Eastern Europe, particularly the Balkans, Central Asia, in which it never really lost authority or influence, but increasingly now in the Middle East, where Russia is really the kingmaker um, in Syria and, you know, on a good day, kind of holds Turkey by the puppet strings. So Russia is not, of course, a hegemon in the Middle East, but it is far more prominently there than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. We also cannot forget China, which is an emerging power, almost becoming an uncontested power in East Asia, and also filling in a lot of neglected gaps in Africa. Like, you wouldn't really think that China's influence in Africa is strong, but, you know, China kind of secretly, quietly snuck into Africa, which was, you know, up until about a decade ago, mostly ignored, just exploited for its raw materials. Now, that's not to say that China is somehow... Um, you know, turning Africa into a series of client states. But their foreign policy is pretty, you know, straightforward and self-evident. And that is, you know, if you're willing to do business with us and you're willing to um, allow us to kind of be your urban developers, um, oh, and you don't recognize Taiwan as a country, uh, we don't really care what type of government you are. You could be democracy, you could be authoritarian, it's, it's all good. To a lesser extent, but something that needs attention, India is becoming um, a regional player and not altogether a, a willing partner with American interests in South Asia. To that, I would say if there was going to be any regional power, any regional native power in the Middle East, I'm putting my money on Iran. Um, Iran's fortunes uh, changed significantly with the collapse of the Hussein regime in Iraq in 2003. And um, has been sort of um, indirectly banking on a growing sense of anti-American sentiment in the Middle East since the, you know, Bush Jr. led war on terror. That's not to say that Iran is going to be a regional hegemon. Um, Iran does secure strategic partnerships with Russia, um, but at the same time, it seems to be counterbalanced by Israel and Saudi Arabia. But once again, if I was to say who has the advantage, um, even if it's 60-40, one over the other, Iran is a, you know, an emerging power that must be considered when one is engaging in Middle Eastern affairs. And then finally, we have the European Union, which isn't really a state, but is developing sort of a standalone independent foreign policy, um, if not just on the European continent itself, um, but let's say increasingly in its near neighborhood, like North Africa, especially when it comes to uh, security affairs um, with, um, with Libya. 
um, the European Union is probably going to be the most cooperative of these new uh, powers, these new rivals to the United States. But the European Union, if we can call it a unified body of, of, of thought and consensus, you know, isn't going to march lockstep with the United States anymore. And it doesn't really matter whether it's Trump or Biden or really anybody else. But um, I, I think what we're seeing, um, at least specifically now, and this kind of took me by surprise, is that if the European Union is going to be a standalone voice in regional affairs, up to about two, three months ago, I would have said it would have resided in Germany. I would have said that Angela Merkel or whoever replaces her would kind of speak on behalf of that. Interestingly enough, um, and we haven't talked about it that much in class, France is under, under Emmanuel Macron is kind of taking the mantle and asserting uh, the EU's positions on a number of issues in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, particularly against Turkey, um, and has taken a more active role in providing collective security and counterterrorism in both North Africa and West Africa, um, without asking the United States for any kind of involvement. So as you can see, right, the world in 2021 is, you know, certainly what I would call lopsided multipolarity in the sense that, yes, there are other powers in the world. The lopsidedness comes from the idea that the United States remains a major world power. And I guess comparative to all the others, it is more powerful than any of the others, uh, you know, still more powerful than China, than Russia, than anyone else. But it doesn't have the capability to act as a hegemon. So, you know, comparatively speaking, the United States, let's say, has a plurality of authority, but not a majority. That's where the lopsidedness comes in. We also have to take into account that the world in 2021 has not been very kind. It's not been rather, it, it hasn't been very optimistic for liberal democracies around the world. And I hate to break this to you. Democracies are failing. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all receding into authoritarianism. No. But what is happening is that the idea of liberal democracy, the idea that the free market will somehow guide and direct all social, political, cultural, institutional problems, um, is becoming incredibly transparent. Um, the idea that the liberal democratic states um, mobilized by transnational global capitalism, which was something that was used you know, very optimistically in the 1990s, that's kind of running out of gas right now. Uh, we can see um, not just in some easy cases like Russia and Turkey, where authoritarianism is really asserting its, its position, um, but even in erstwhile relatively cooperative countries like Brazil and India, where executive leaders now are becoming far more dictatorial. And I will go on record to say that the current president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, is quite possibly one of the most dangerous people in power right now on the planet. And I say this knowing that there are people like Erdogan in Turkey, Kim Jong-un in North Korea, Xi Jinping in China, and still even Donald Trump in the White House. What makes Bolsonaro so dangerous is his incessant and uncompromising assault on the Brazilian rainforest in the name of profit and urban development. And, you know, it's one thing to scuttle political rights and civil liberties like Erdogan is doing in Turkey. These things can always be over, you know, overturned. It's another thing to keep your country uh, behind um, some wall of totalitarianism like Kim Jong-un is doing with North Korea. Eventually, that country will open up. Assaulting the Brazilian rainforest and reducing the amount of trees effectively that will absorb the carbon emissions in the you know in the air directly contributes to global warming and rampant climate change to the point where at some point the brazilian rainforest will not be able to regrow once a certain point is reached the brazilian rainforest transitions ecologically ecosystem wise into a savanna and once that happens 
um, we are in for some catastrophic consequences. So while I don't want you to think that Bolsonaro is the only person that has run Brazil that has assaulted the rainforest, the man just does it in an uncompromising, just absolute fascistic way possible. Um, and yes, he's, he's not exactly the smartest person on the planet, but he does have a number of people supporting him for being a job creator. I think on a more benign level, a, a great example of looking at the assault on liberal democracy, a reverse wave of, um, you know, of, of, of liberal, um, neoliberal democracy is what we find in Central Europe. Um, and most people don't really think of, you know, Hungary, Poland, or the Czech Republic as something indicative of the world. I've gone on record a number of times this semester by saying that unfortunately the future of parliamentary democracies is what Central Europe, the Visegrad 4, looks like. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with that, it's a parliamentary system which is dominated and controlled by periodic elections in multiple political parties that basically just vote in one illiberal political party after another. Parties that use um, elements of quasi-authoritarian populism as a way of promoting nativism, um, scuttling political rights and civil liberties, putting a clamp down on media press freedoms, and kind of you know, governing their countries as some, you know, fortified uh, garrison that defends their borders against the assaults of globalization, human migration, and whatnot. And while I don't want you to think that, you know, Hungary, Poland, or the Czech Republic are threats to global democracy around the world, they are kind of indicative of where a lot of these erstwhile liberal democracies are going. Uh, right now, at this point in 2020, um, you know, the only two countries in the world that I could say are paragons of democratic virtue in the liberal sense is Germany and Canada. And Merkel's on her way to retire, and so we don't know where that country's going to go. And Canada, I mean, Canada is, is basically at this point some centrist, govern, you know, untenable government run by Justin Trudeau, who is increasingly unpopular. And Canada does have a Trumpian type of conservative movement. So, you know, my assessments for, um, you know, democracy uh, this day and age are not very all that good. I mean, I, you know, I've had, you know, discussions with some of you about some of you think that Biden is great for this country. I think he is going to be, in, in my opinion, I think Biden is going to drive the Democratic Party to his grave because he is going to govern um, under this mantra of neoliberal centrism, which has no public support anymore unless you are you know, uh, independently wealthy, a trust fund baby, or part of the 1%. We are looking at democracy today governed in the near absence of left-wing progressivism. And in the absence of any real left-wing working class parties, the right, the political right, in almost every country outside of the United States, picks up on this stuff, but does so through an ethnocentric, um, xenophobic lens. And so this is why I'm thinking that a lot of these countries that I've mentioned before uh, are entrenching themselves um, and becoming electorally popular uh, because they are getting votes of an erstwhile left-wing working class group that would be more in favor of, you know, social democratic norms, but are, you know, have to vote for parties that are promising that while at the same time, you know, discriminating against minorities, um, shutting down alternative voices for the press, and kind of governing in a quasi-autocratic nature. And if this doesn't make you depressed enough, right, um, we are looking at the increased need of international organizations to address um, transnational problems. Right? If this is really the hour of the UN, the UN didn't get the message. If this is the hour of transnational organizations to kind of uh, take the lead and start promoting policy um, in the name of defending um, and protecting the environment and natural resources in providing a more leading and guiding role in conflict resolution and state building, in upholding the principles of human rights, addressing the pandemic problems of human migration and refugees, and in strengthening um, existing but often ignorable precepts of international law and international reforms. Um, as I said, a lot of international organizations are failing at that. 
Um, one very quick example is the transborder conflict in the Caucasus between Armenia and Azerbaijan was mitigated not by the United Nations, but by Russia, right, by Russia. The United Nations has little um, presence in post-conflict Syria. Uh, the United Nations has been all but sidelined in many of the existing power states, including Kosovo. So the United Nations is great at, you know, providing these lofty goals and aspirations for a more peaceful future, but that's usually where their participation ends. They don't really do much in terms of implementing or being more proactive in addressing these problems. And when we get to the issue of climate change, we can have climate conference after climate conference about what needs to be done, but unless you have the ability of enforcement like let's say the European Union does, uh, states are left to decide how they want to implement. And, you know, states that might want to improve their environmental conditions are oftentimes pressured against it because of economic concerns and pressures of investors that want to use their country as a backdoor for, I don't know, dumping toxic waste or whatever it happens to be in exchange for money. So the world is complex, folks. The world is complex. The world has a lot of issues to solve. This lecture will not solve any one of them, but it will hopefully um, raise some awareness about what needs you know, to be done and you know, where we can go. So taking that all into account here, right? what issues in you know, 2020, 2021 are transnational? Right? Issues of global capital, the environment, human rights, collective security, international terrorism. These are all issues that cannot be solved by one country alone. These are issues that really seem to be the sole responsibility of transnational organizations, either global or regional. And I'm going to be going back and forth between looking at the UN and the EU in this lecture, really for two reasons. One, the EU is a great example of an effective regional organization. The UN has the ability of being, you know, the one global organization that everybody looks to. Um, but once the question is, how are we going to implement what we just came up with, uh, you know, comes up, they all kind of look around and like, I don't know, we'll hope ECOSOC deals with that, right? But look, global capital, the environment, human rights, collective security, international terrorism, there is not one country that can deal with this, okay? So where does that leave international organizations today? We devoted an entire class to these things. And if you're sitting here listening uh, at this point and thinking, are these things just nothing more than there for participation? Do they actually do anything? I think it's worth going over a few points that I have tried to drill in to memory over and over again throughout this semester, beginning with probably one of the most fundamental truths to this class. And that is... International organizations are only as powerful, only as meaningful, and only as effective as the member states make them out to be. So, you know, we can sit here and lament about how the United Nations has all of the um, authority of a high school hall monitor, you know, a crossing guard for that matter. Um, and we can certainly talk about how the UN uh, produces a number of bureaucrats that, you know, like to give you the impression that they're far more important than they truly are. And I've listened to these lofty speeches of UN officials that, um, you know, I, I would imagine hope someone's recording that and puts it up on YouTube for, you know, for the feels. But at the end of the day, they're, you know, largely useless. Um, and yeah, I am the IR program director saying that. But please understand right? Please understand. The effectiveness of these organizations is once again contingent on the abilities, the capabilities, and the power that member states make them out to be. In other words, UN member states could empower the UN to be a world organization. UN member states could empower the UN to have much more enforceability, if so desired. Which means that while it is not impossible, um, and workable, right, there needs to be, you know, the biggest obstacle in this is not the UN itself, but the states. So until we kind of breach through that obstacle, we have to come away with the understanding that most IOs, international organizations, they're strong on policy, but they're weak on enforcement. 
And that's because this is how they were designed by states. Right? They are good on raising awareness for what needs to be done, but we leave it to the states to figure out how to implement that. And yet, once again, if you're thinking, man, the program director in international relations is telling you how useless the United Nations is, hang on a second here. There's a reason why this thing is still around, and there is a reason why it is still looked to as usually the first and last institution for addressing these problems. And that is because IOs, whether they are global or regional, they are increasingly seen by a wider public audience as having a responsibility to tackle these problems and challenges that are beyond the capabilities of any one state. And if I can, you know, provide a little sense of optimism here, younger generations, and that's not just younger generations in developing countries, I'm talking about the developed world as well, realize that many of their elected officials are useless, incapable, and uninterested in tackling issues like the environment. Therefore, they want the international um, organizations like the UN to be more proactive. They would absolutely love for the UN to muzzle Bolsonaro. And in some cases, even go so far as to say to Brazil, you are completely incapable and irresponsible over the rainforest. As a matter of fact, I, the UN, I, the Secretary General, I'm going to turn the Amazon rainforest into international protected into an international protected zone and that includes not just large chunks of brazil but bolivia peru venezuela and others right that is going to be off limits to states and while that may seem radical younger generations are like totally do do that and while you're at it don't just do the amazon rainforest do the one in indonesia and malaysia as well also um take over a couple of open space areas in india before they're overpopulated Right? And the reason why people think this today is because there is this increasing realization that there is not one state that can solve all of the world's problems. Right? And simply on, simply on the idea, simply on the idea that implementation ends at the border. It's not that the United States doesn't have the power to run the planet, or China for that matter, but just from a legal standpoint, the United States... Let's just say, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, right, the United States decided it is going to take the lead on environmental cleanup and addressing, you know, like, uh, you know, a, a global Green New Deal. We are going to turn the, w the world carbon neutral, not by 2050, but by 2030, okay? Ten years, it is going to be some major draconian, um, you know, um, policies. And the United States is going to do this. The U.S. has to realize there are 192 other countries in the world. So while the U.S. could take a lead in this, they cannot force Canada to do what it wants. They can't force Mexico. They can't, for, they can't force uh, the Bahamas. They can't force Cuba. They're certainly not going to be able to force China or Russia. So my point here is that even if we said that there could be a state that could do this, it's not that they don't have the resources. They don't have the diplomatic clout. The United States would effectively have to take over the whole planet in order to have this happen. So it's a cooperative effort, even in the most benign diplomatic levels. It requires cooperation. And who does the coordinating of that cooperation? It's got to be IOs. It has to be. There's no other way to do this. So even though we can say, yeah, IOs are kind of ineffective these days, Man, we need to empower them in order to address these larger issues. And look, if nothing else, if nothing else, okay, organizations like the UN, the EU, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, whatever it is, right, if nothing else, they practice or should practice um, this type of social constructivism that we've been talking about over the past uh, few weeks or so, right? Social constructivism, it's kind of a newer version of the theory of constructivism that promotes a certain identity, promotes a certain set of values and behaviors in the world, right? Social constructivism is the, you know, in, in so many words is we can't get people to reduce carbon emissions. We can't get states, we can't force them right, to abide by all the principles of the Paris Climate Accord, right? But what we can do 
is create an international policy, create an international um, society in which something like that is the desired goal, right? That's the objective for the international community. So social constructivism, if nothing else, um, you know, creates a certain set of policy pressures on states to conform to these norms um, and will incentivize cooperation instead of non-compliance. In other words, states that decide to go along with these larger transnational policies will be seen as team players, um, active participants in making the world better, um, you know, and countries that just on a subjective normative sense give a damn beyond their own economic bottom dollar, which I guess a really good way of looking at how effective this is, is the reverse trend, right? When the United States withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, um, you know, it, it's not like Trump all of a sudden decided to stop, um, you know, recycling. I mean, the man has been, the man has unleashed an unwavering assault on the environment for the past four years. But when the United States is, um, uh, you know, term limits or when it's, you know, when the expiration date for it to renew its membership in the Paris Climate Accord passed and went and Trump said, screw it, I'm not doing it. Um, the United States lost a lot of credibility in the world. And I don't think that that credibility is going to just all of a sudden come back with Biden's inauguration. Right? He did say that pretty much one of the first things, and we're going to hold him to this, that he's going to you know, re-enter the U.S. into the Paris Climate Accord. Great. And why is that? Because of our reputation. Right? Because of our reputation, because of our uh, perceived notion that for the past four years, we have been antagonistic towards the world. And that will, you know, lead some states to not see us as a leader anymore or not want to cooperate or invest or, you know, whatever it happens to be. So social constructivism, if nothing else, is a great way of getting states to realize that things like environmental protection, upholding human rights, you know, doing all the nice stuff out there will make you seem as a cooperative member of the global community. It's not much, but you know what? It does... It is a type of indirect um, pressure, an indirect type of, you know, diplomacy. Um, so, you know, we've said, okay, what does that say about international organizations? What does this, what does all of this say about the concept of international organization, right? More, more so the theory, the idea of coordination, of global governance. Well, if anything, it says that, you know, global governance, however way you want to call this, is unbelievably important because, you know, global governance is a multi-involved project by a number of international actors. So as I've been saying since this video began, states are no longer the only actors in the international arena. They have to share the space with formal organizations, informal organizations, IGOs, NGOs, private groups, corporations, think tanks, religious organizations, right? Religious organizations are becoming much more uh, prominent in talking about global governance. Um, you know, whether it's the Pope or the ecumenical patriarch or the Dalai Lama, um, you know, they have voices on the international field as well. Um, and I would just say at the end, sort of this emerging global citizenry, you know, which can include people like you and me who realize that, yeah, I mean, we all come from our respective countries or we currently live in one that's not our own home country, but we have a planet to share. And, uh, you know, problems that uh, occur someplace very far away from where we live can have repercussive effects in our own backyard. Um, and so we realize that, you know, hey, we do have to tackle something like the global climate crisis, right? It doesn't affect me right here in New York and New Jersey, but yeah, I mean, I am concerned about the polar ice caps melting. I am concerned that we are less and less likely to get snow um, during the late fall winter season. I, mean, I can remember 20, 30 years ago, we got snow all the time. Now we get a lot of rain. It rarely freezes, right? I'm concerned about that. I am part of this global citizenry. And I think a number of you are that too. What this also says about international organization is that states may continue to enjoy comparative leverage in implementation, right? States may not be the, you know, the only actor anymore. They still have, I would say, leverage because, you know, we're going to get to this, you know, later on in the, in the lecture here. 
But for all of their sovereign capabilities and for all of their decision making and all of their, you know, my leadership is voted in and I don't vote for you, EU, whatever, whatever, uh, there are very, very few states in the world, if any, uh, that are not pressured into the decisions and the actions that they make by external forces. So, you know, in other words, states may still be um, an important actor in implementing stuff, but in an increasingly globalized environment, there is not one country out there that is immune from neighborhood effects, from external stimuli, right? Especially when we're looking at the developing world. Um, you know, we can talk about how uh, countries like China or India uh, can decide what they want to do uh, with their own, you know, ecosystems. But China and India are rapidly industrializing and environmental policies are going to have to be weighed against their own transnational economic commitments and objectives. And the sad reality is that um, even though we have talked about this for years, if not decades, economic development takes precedence over anything sociopolitical, right? Economic development, economic um, productivity, economic stability will always, always, always be chosen um, against that of social democratic welfare. And if you don't believe me, right, we spent a good deal of time about a month or two ago looking at the European Union and all of those countries in Eastern Europe that wanted to get in. Remember, if it has to come down to economic solvency or democratic accountability, if we have to throw democracy under the bus in order to get the country economically compatible, this is just what's going to happen. This is one of the real downsides, one of the real dark sides of globalization over the past 30 years. And so, you know, that kind of leads us to, you know, think about the the need for better, lack of better term here, better international assistance. You, know, you want to give economic assistance. You want to invest in a developing country to get them on the global um, grid. You're going to have to do more than just simply throw money at them and expect them to just, you know, turn an otherwise pristine natural environmental area into um, a mining shaft. You know, this sort of the thing. It's like, okay, you've, we've got raw materials in the ground. Um, you know, this tree, this forest, this lake, this ecosystem looks nice, but we got to get to that stuff. And oftentimes, if it's run by an outside company, they don't really care. All right? This is the kind of thing. Now, is Brazil currently the way that it is? Um, simply because of economic pressures? Or is it just, you know, is, is Brazil's assault on the rainforest something inherently Brazilian? I don't think so, you know? I mean, Jair Bolsonaro is, as I said, he's an evil, evil, incompetent little man. But Jair Bolsonaro is who he is and where he is because of the international investments and pressures um, and engagements that have been made with Brazil. Brazil is expected to be one of the biggest economies of Latin America. And if that means development of untapped areas, then so be it. This is the problem, right? Untapped natural environments, um, they exist in this world today usually in two scenarios. One, they haven't been uprooted yet because the country is not yet seen by outside developers for exploitation. Or, and this is rare, but it's I'll bring it up, the country has already passed its industrialization period and now has the money and the technocratic finances to protect whatever areas have not been. Um, already exploited. So, you know, I'm thinking right now of, you know, all of these hiking trails and, and national parks in Switzerland and Austria, right? Beautiful, beautiful countryside. But Switzerland and Austria are so unbelievably developed. They're so economically developed that they can afford to keep these things as pristine national parks. That's not the case with Mali or Kenya or Malawi or Brazil or Indonesia, right? So when we talk about global governance, we realize that the problems that we are talking about today, resource problems, environmental problems, socioeconomic inequalities, look, folks, these are all caused by 30 years of unrelenting neoliberal globalization. And so it's really the task of international organization to rectify this. We can't just hold a gun to Brazil's, you know, metaphoric head and say, stop chopping down trees in the rainforest. 
We can't threaten to overthrow Bolsonaro's regime and replace him with someone else and thinking that the, rain, that the, that the Brazilian rainforest is going to be untouched. This is not going to happen. Brazil needs to be somehow coaxed di economically different to say, look, you can develop, you can urbanize, you can globalize without destroying a vital ecosystem to the planet. Now, how that happens, I mean, I don't have the answers for that right now, but suffice to say, right, there are answers, there are suggestions. And so I guess since we've been talking about this um, already enough, um, it's worth looking into, right, that last final big chapter in KMS, the environment and the effects of climate change and the hope of sustainable living. Right, folks, let me tell you something. I kind of regret leaving this for the very end because if there ever was, if there ever was a transnational set of challenges and issues today, it's the environment. If there is anything that requires the active participation of, organ of international organizations and organization, it is this. This is the one thing that actually keeps me up at night, right? I may lament rising authoritarianism in Turkey. I may lament uh, the you know, severe limitations of political rights and civil liberties in Russia. These things can always be changed politically. The environment is a one-time deal. And you destroy an ecosystem, it is difficult, if not impossible, to build it back. You drive a species into extinction, that's it. It's done. Gone. Over. Finito. And the problem here, folks, is that the assault on the environment has been really within the last century or more. Um, you know, but, e but even more so, unrelentingly, the last 50 years. Um, the last 50 years has just been an absolute... Um, uncompromising assault to the point of saying, you know, we're in 2020. I don't know where the world's going to look in 2050. You know, we're saying we're going to be um, carbon neutral by 2050. For what? By that point, another 20 years will go by if we continue with the patterns of deforestation and environmental degradation. There won't be anything to be carbon neutral. So I need to emphasize, right, when we talk about the environment, it's more than just climate change. Right? It is more than just simply global warming because people think, oh, well, if the planet is just warming up by one degree to three degrees, I mean, how bad is that? Um, it's bad. It is very, very bad. I, I, I kind of wish that we spent more time talking about um, politics and the environment because the, e the ecosystem is so unbelievably fragile. Um, one major change just causes a chain reaction of others. So... It's more than just climate change. It is the depletion or scarcity of resources, right? The rapid pursuit of natural resources to fuel the global capital engine um, not only depletes these things from the environment, but will increase the likelihood of conflict over their sources, you know? So like, a century to a century and a half ago, right, people went to war over gold and diamonds and, and stuff like that, right? In this day and age, some of the most expensive commodities are things like water, oil, ore, and even more so, the sources of these commodities. Right? You would think water, absolutely so. Water, you would think, oh, this is the most plentiful resource on the planet. Who controls the source of that water? And unfortunately, in this day and age, a lot of the water is now, in legal terms, privately owned by corporations like Nestle. Like Nestle, you know, the big chocolate company. Nestle, I'll go on record and say Nestle is easily one of the most evil companies out there. I, I will go out of my way to make certain that I don't buy anything related to Nestle. Because Nestle will be one of those companies that invests in a developing area for something, anything, some food source, some drink, whatever it is. But they end up, as part of the investment process, they end up effectively buying the rights to water, preventing people from drawing water from these water sources, right? Fencing it up, bottling it, and selling it, something that was previously universal and people had a right to get. Now they are selling it to the very same people. So whether it's water, oil, or ore, the threat of conflict over who controls these things in an increasingly global capitalist arena 
is fueling conflict today. Not so much ethnic ID identities, not so much as simply historical grievances over the boundary being drawn here or there. No, it's who controls what. That is one of the big things. And these resources, as they become more scarce, as they become under the control of private enterprise and industries, um, are turned into luxury goods, right? What we call, you know, like sustainable luxury goods, clean water. Clean water, which for, you know, for us is, well, even better as far as New York City is concerned. Look, I'm from New Jersey, and I can tell you, tap water in New York is great, right? I can drink directly from the sink. I don't, if I moved to Brooklyn or Queens, right, my water purchase would be cut in half because the water is pretty good. But that's a luxury that we have. A lot of places, the water is unsafe for drinking. It's contaminated with a lot of toxins and minerals and chemicals. Um, in some cases, it actually causes cancer. Some places, the water is so toxified um, because of industrial spillovers that those that have the ability of getting clean water are those that are more financially better off. Um, I teach this class on Wednesdays called African Cities. And one of the things that we talked about a couple of weeks ago is the problem of water treatment in developing communities um, around Ghana and Senegal. And the richer and more politically connected you are, the more likely your house is going to be connected to uh, not only the main water system, but you will be drawing from cleaner water than poorer areas. What becomes more and more available these days is bottled water. And some of those bottled waters are just simply tap water that's been bottled up, nothing else. Still unhealthy, there is still a major black market in many developing communities that sell and smuggle clean water. But even more so, the idea that we consume water in bottles these days means that we are wasting plastic at an unprecedented rate. Right? So just the idea that water has become a private commodity means that we can't just simply turn on our faucets and drink from the, you know, drink from the faucet, but we got to buy and we got to dispose. And where does all that plastic go to? And that's just water. But what about luxury goods that are trafficked, like ivory, animal parts? You know, China's, um, you know, growing um, lust for luxury goods around the world will basically drive every animal other than the panda into extinction. So, you know, the pursuit of these so-called luxury goods like, anim like ivory tusks or rhino horns or other elements are basically driving animals from endangered to critically endangered. Um, they are hunted, killed, poached. Um, and when these are happening in poor areas like Africa, you know, you got to think, you know, who the hell are these poachers and why would they be doing these things? They're dirt poor. They're desperate for any kind of money. This is their livelihood. The demand makes them do this. So the pursuit of resources and luxury goods has made huge amounts of scars on the landscape. And I have to say again, right, overpopulation has been a major problem. And you can agree, disagree, I have to say, I think that one of the biggest problems is, is not a, there's too many people for what we have in the world today. Okay? And there were people that will argue we can produce enough food to feed the planet two times over. That might be true, right? There is no need for people to go hungry in the world today. But what land is needed in order to grow the food and cultivate the food? And we're not just simply talking about people eating rice every day. People need a balanced diet. So that includes grains, fruits, vegetables, meats, other elements, right? How do we feed 7 billion people every single day? So in that regard, what land needs to be set aside? And how much of that needs to be deforested, how much of that needs to be irrigated, and how much of that just simply is taken away from natural ecological ecosystems that will inflict, um, you know, loss of habitat on other animals, on other species. Um, you know, beyond just simply that is the idea that, you know, global capitalism, the industrialization of agriculture, um, has looked for, you know, new and more efficient ways of providing food. 
So, you know, we go from being hunters and gatherers, from being farmers, but now farmers are going into these industrial farmed foods, right? These mass produced um, GMO oriented macro farms that I know as far as the United States, uh, you know, produces an unbelievable amount of food that not the most healthy, right? And, you know, if you ever, ever, ever not want to be a vegetarian, do not look online uh, and do not look up the American meat industry, right? Look, if you got money to buy organic, if you got money to buy local, great. But if you don't, you really don't want to see where your Big Mac comes from. And the problem that we have with this is that macro farming um, is done to meet the increased consumer demand for food every single day. You know, you know how, many, how many burgers does McDonald's make every day? Just That's just McDonald's. What about Burger King? What about Wendy's? What about Jack in the Box? What about In-N-Out? What about, uh, you know, any of these other things? I mean, how much meat is produced every single day? And you got to think to yourself, how much waste results from that? What are the methane gases that come from this massive rampant slaughter of beef and pork and chicken and lamb and other elements like that, right? And knowing full well that if you want to be more environmentally conscious, you don't want GMOs in your meat because, you know, look, if you ever, you know, if you come from Europe, you know, you know, you got to eat meat pretty fast or you got to preserve it. Otherwise, it's going to go bad. Americans like to go food shopping once every three weeks. So stuff will sit in the fridge. Stuff will sit in the pantry for weeks on end. You ever look at the bread? You know, in the bread aisle, you're like, well, that bread looks the same two weeks in. That's not normal. If you're from Europe, and I know some of you are, you know that bread becomes hard and stale in 24 hours. That is fresh bread. There's no preservatives. There's no nothing in there. But you got to think to yourself, right? You're eating stuff with preservatives. You're eating stuff with chemicals. You're eating stuff with, um, you know, sort of, the, you know, these biochemicals to keep them from rotting or whatever. What does that do to your own health? What does that do to your digestive system? And I want to, you know, deter too much into studies of public health here, but you ever notice how Americans are just, you know, disproportionately obese? And the poorer they are, the fatter they get. It's not because they're eating themselves to death. It's because the food is not processed. You know, you go to Europe, you can eat like a kid. You know, you can go to Italy and you can eat your weight in pasta. And these people are still bean poles. Maybe it's also because they walk everything off. So you kind of see that this is more than just simply climate change, but it's the idea of a sustainable food supply, right? A food supply that is looking for some, you know, demand in meeting, uh, you know, customer expectation in an industrialized world. So the quality is, you know, inversely related to the price. The lower the price, right, the lower the quality. The higher the quality, you're going to be paying a lot more for it, but not everybody has that money uh, to do so. So, you know, at the risk of once again coming across as the incessant uh, Marxist, the the never-ending leftist uh, in class here, and you know, I should mention that about 10, 15 years ago, I was much more right-wing than um, I am today, but, you know, political science will kind of turn you uh, into one of these things, right? I have to say, look, one of the big problems is global capitalism. Now, I'm not saying, you know, get rid of capitalism, let's all go live on communes, but the relentless demand for raw materials and fossil fuels have driven an enlarging global economy, right? So, you know, ju just, the, just the talk of the food industry alone has led us to think, look, the demand to have, a, a, you know, a, a fully stocked supermarket in every single town is going to really place an inordinate amount of pressure on food gathering. And that's just the United States. What about developing countries like India and China, where there is a rising middle class, a middle class that wants, right, suburban houses, that wants at least one or two cars, that, you know, becomes consumer driven, you know? If we were to just simply reduce the populations of India and China to a billion each, they're a billion and change, right? but let's just be simple here, right? A billion in China, a billion in India. And let's say that 25% of the population are an emerging middle class. Now that doesn't say much. That means that the rest of the population is still relatively poor, but what's 25% of a billion, right? 250 million. And now we've got 500 million new people in one part of the world 
that drive cars, that need gas for those cars, that go shopping, that want, you know, a little bit more high-end living than living in some village, which means, um, you know, new demands on energy, electricity, water, sewage, um, all sorts of things like that, right? <clears throat> and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say neither China nor India are the most eco-friendly in terms of urban planning. Um, so you can only imagine, right, the pollution, the um, gas emissions, um, you know, these cars that are driven in India and China, they're not the most fuel efficient either. So you can only think what this does to the air pollution, what this does to the ground, this does to the soil, the water, the air that people breathe, right? And so global capitalism has been a primary catalyst in modernizing large parts of the world, but at the expense of sustainable living. We are looking at years of industrial deregulation, right? This is the whole neoliberal structure here. You know, the deregulation of the state in the name of, you know, reducing overhead costs and in meeting demand quotas. Look, China and India are also manufacturing countries, China in particular, okay? China will, China makes, you know, half the world's products. And the reason why they do that isn't because China's got the space or they've got the can-do spirit. But China has been deregulated to such a degree in what it can, what it needs in order to make products fast, cheap, and reliable. What does that say about the environment? What does that say about the quality and the conditions of working? What does that say about income? What does that say about the quality of food? or the um, biodegradability of plastic. How about just simply the paper industry? You know, we like to think that we're living in a digital world these days, and there's junk mail all the time. Books are being published, newspaper. How much paper, how many trees are being cut down, right? And you might think to yourself, all right, well, you know, what if we, um, you know, eliminate uh, half the fast food restaurants? What if we go from paper to hemp? What if we go from plastic to some new form of, I don't know, biodegradable plastic? And we've been talking about this for years. And the answer is, do you know how much money it would take to switch gears? Do you know how much lobbying the lumber industry has for getting people to buy trees for paper? The reason why we haven't switched over to hemp is because the tree industry, the lumber industry, the, the, the newspaper industry, they're all locked in together in making money off of your purchase. When we could switch over to hydrogen cars, we could switch over to electric cars, we could switch over to a lot of these things, the industries that would be affected now suddenly find themselves disadvantaged. So they spend an inordinate amount of money lobbying people, especially like our idiots in Washington, to keep this thing going until the current CEO and board of directors die. And then they don't care what happens. But more than just simply capital greed, there has been this prioritization of economic, and I'll put this in quotes, modernization at the cost of nearly all other indices. So for the past 30 years, this idea of neoliberal global capital has been understood to be driven by private enterprise. The state does not have any real say. The state needs to deregulate and it needs to withdraw <clears throat> from the economic arena in order for the market to, to reach its full potential. And this is the reason why countries like China, um, but even more so today, <clears throat> and we don't talk about it a lot, Many countries in Africa will be the next level of sweatshop exploitation. Now, what does this do to state sovereignty, to state decision making? It withers it away. What does this do to the ecosystem? You don't want to know, folks. Okay, you don't want to know, you know, because if the demand for things are faster, cheaper, and yesterday, we're not all that concerned about environmental regulations. That slows up production that increases costs of production. And look, green politics, they're great. They are absolutely necessary. They're, they're expensive and they're unprofitable, at least as far as bottom line arguments are today. You can go to the supermarket and you can buy 
right? Environmental friendly tuna. You can buy, you know, non-GMO. You can buy things that at least as far as the labeling is concerned, says that they have taken some precaution into defending a small element of the environment into account. Be prepared to spend anywhere from an additional two to 20 bucks. Now, if money is not a problem, Bob's your uncle. But if you are on a tight budget, uh, you are going to go for the cheapest thing out there. And this is kind of a sad reality. Green politics, until they are profitable, until you can make money, serious money, off of green politics, off of a Green New Deal, the market is going to resist. That's the sad reality. That is the sad reality. I've been around long enough to know this. The market will resist green alternatives unless it is profitable. Until that time, path-dependent structures will continue to pressure people to just, you know, extract oil, extract natural gas, do it the old way that we've been doing because the cost of switching everything over would be too abrupt and too prolonged and we're not making enough money. This is the reality, unfortunately, that we live in. The reality is also saying, hey folks, you know what? We've been saying this since the 70s. I, I remember as early as elementary school, we were told to recycle, give a hoot, don't pollute. You know, we, there's, only, you know there's only so much gas, there's only so much oil that we can use in the world. Well, 30 some odd years later, guess what? Now we are reaching a critical point of no return. We could talk about this stuff in the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s. And we can talk about global warming. We can talk about, you know, rising sea levels. Hey, guess what? That shit's here. Okay? We have seen already, right, the depletion of natural resources through raw material extraction, increased fossil fuel demand, and a depletion in food and nutrition alongside a population explosion and dwindling living space has caused irreparable damage um, to the expense of nature and the endangerment of both flora and fauna. We are reading more and more about this in newspapers and journals and network news and cable news and you know YouTube podcasts today and whatever, and we begin to realize that the rampant pursuit of global capital particularly driven by race to the bottom tactics, remember, where countries will try to undercut each other in how cheap they can provide labor, how much they can deregulate their system in order to get a foreign investor to come in, what you need to do in order to get them to build into your country, and we begin to see the residual problems. We begin to see the tangible problems, especially in Africa. Africa has been hit probably the worst because the states never had the ability of withstanding international economic pressures. East Asia had some ways of doing it, and China, one of China's big problems that everybody in the, you know, Wall Street says today is that China's not rolling over and playing dead. China's, you know, doing it to their own game here. But when we look at Africa, we begin to see, you know, the problems here, okay? An unprecedented rise in carbon emissions. They are increasing every single year. If it wasn't for COVID, this year. 2020 would have been one of the worst years on record. I remember reading back in April that the lockdown for about two weeks or so, right, um, cleared up the waters in the Venetian canals, um, reduced the amount of carbon emissions over cities in China by more than half. So it kind of is like, look, if the world shuts down and goes Amish for like a month, it is significant what we can do, right? It's not that we can, you know, say mission accomplished, but the, the, the number of emissions, if the factories literally shut, the effects are very, very tangible. But guess what? We're not shutting things down. We are seeing still a rise in carbon emissions. And what does this lead to, right? Melting polar ice caps, they're here, right? And that leads to rising ocean levels, increased aridity of dry lands, right? You would think that rising sea levels would, you know, moisten the world. No, right? You, you change one ecosystem, it creates an entirely different chain of events. The reason why we get warm fronts now, in late November, early December, coastal towns and cities are flooded, especially when hurricanes and cyclones and tornadoes hit, um, and to the point where some island countries like Kiribati and Tuvalu and um, you know, Micronesia, 
uh, Fiji, these countries are actually in danger of literally being swallowed up by the sea if ocean levels continue to rise. And that's, you know, that's not saying anything about coastal cities here in the United States. You know, Miami is threatened in being underwater. New York City is threatened to be submerged or large parts of Manhattan are threatened. I mean, these things are happening. And, you know, we are reaching a point where if we don't deal with it now, we just have to sit back and watch the apocalypse from happening. Right. When we talk about the erosion of arable lands, the, des you know, the desertification, right, deforestation effectively creates an, a, you know, a chain reaction across the ecosystems that makes previously agricultural lands barren. Right. It's you know, the reason why the Sahara is the Sahara is because, you know, when the Himalayas kind of erupted, God knows how many eons ago, right, certain air was directed elsewhere. So Africa, which was once verdant, like we're talking like way, 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 way back in the day, right, now becomes, you know, large areas of northern central Africa are nothing but deserts. Now, what does this do today? Well, it leaves you know, major ruptures in, you know, food chains, ruptures the ecosystem, uh, agricultural space is reducted, uh, is reduced, and when people can't grow and live on certain areas, where do they go? They go elsewhere. They'll migrate to cities, which... You know, cities no longer have the infrastructure to sustain them. So we end up, you know, getting these peripheral shanty towns and these informal dwellings on the outskirts of cities in Asia and Africa where try to take a guess at how environmentally friendly these places are. They're not, right? So people moving to places to find some quality of life end up overpopulating areas even more adding to the amount of carbon emissions, sewage, garbage, other elements like this, right? And as the population levels continue to increase, Africa's populations are slated to grow by, you know, more than a billion by, you know, 2100. Other areas around the world, population levels are declining. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that people just think, I can't have a kid, I can't afford a kid uh, in this economic system. Africa, populations are exploding. Uh, we are talking about major cities that are going to rival populations of London, Paris, Istanbul, you know, Shanghai, New York, you know, what have you. And these migrations are looking for places to live a sustainable life. Limited resources are going to cause conflict. Migrants are going to be discriminated against, targeted, victimized. This is going to just lead to greater conflict. And while we're talking about all this stuff, I'm, I'm sorry to be really down in the dumps here, right? Plants and animals will be driven into extinction. Um, you, you know, you read these reports or you just read the headlines and you don't want to read it because they're too you know, depressing about the, you know, the number of lions and tigers and elephants and, you know, dolphins and whoever in the world that have just been reduced to critical levels. Um, you know, can we save them? Yes, we still can. But here's the thing. We're at a point now where in order to reverse these catastrophic trends, we have to put a systemic stop to whatever it is that we are doing globally. Right? We cannot just, you know, put a band-aid on this. We have to think differently. We have to act differently. We have to prioritize differently. And once again, this is not the vocation of just one country. This involves international organized cooperation. Okay? Rising population will increase demand on resources and living space. One of the b big reasons why populations in Africa and India are improving is because mortality rates are declining. So we've got this big idea that we're going to send doctors without borders into the developing world and we're going to vaccinate children and we're going to provide, you know, irrigation canals and water pumps and people are not going to die of malaria or tuberculosis. Great. Nothing wrong with that. But guess what? Poor people, and this is sort of an, you know, unpolitically correct statement to make, but it's backed up empirically. Poor people have a lot of kids because there's no birth control. And if you come from relatively poor backgrounds, you end up having a number of kids knowing that half of them are going to die before they turn five. But when all of them are now vaccinated and you still don't have birth control and you still are considered to be, if you're a female, little more than a baby incubator, well, beforehand, you might have given birth to six kids and ended up staying with three. Now you're giving birth to six and all six are surviving. So you got to feed all six of them or even more 
right? So this is where the problems of population um, jut into problems of resource allocation and the environment. Now, can we tell everybody to stop having kids? Can we enforce a one-child policy? Um, you know, how do we get birth control into traditional rural areas? You kind of see, so you, you know, you do like, oh, we're going to improve public health, but you improve public health by reducing child mortality, but you decrease public health by now having more people live in an area where they previously half of them would have died, and now they're pollution creators, now they are susceptible to other diseases, and so you solve one problem by creating, you know, two others. The amount of people within an area, you know, leads to extreme endangerment and extinction, as I said, of plants and animals. Whether it's just the demand of food, the lack of space for other animals to live in, uh, the real unfortunate reality of trophy hunting, you know, the rich and affluent love to just, you know, do big game hunting for no apparent reason to say, oh, look at me, I killed a, you know, giraffe or whatever it is. And the pervasive notion of pollution, which even if you don't directly attack the ecosystem, the air quality will, right? So you see how one thing is connected to another. All the while, right, the demand for fossil fuels has increased and has led to continued attacks on the environment. So whether it's Russian or American drilling in the Arctic Circle, you might have remembered in the last year of Obama's presidency, the big protests over the Dakota Access Pipeline, in which oil companies felt that it was their right to drill over, you know, Indian uh, reservations and people who were protesting, uh, not just the invasion of these, you know, native uh, reservations, but also the environment, were being beaten, were being shot at by National Guards under the orders from Obama himself. So please don't think that getting rid of Trump and going back to an Obama-era president like Biden is going to make anything better. He ain't. Biden is not. Right? He's a big fan of fossil fuels as well. Um, or how about the idea that every, t you know, every other month or year or whatever it is, we hear of an oil company, you know, like BP or Sunoco or Hess, that just spills oil into the Gulf of Mexico, into the ocean, right? Deregulated um, drilling, um, cutthroat prices, you know, the cheapest degrees of construction so people at the top can retain as much money as possible. It's going to lead to a rupture, right? And they're like, oh, no, no, we're going to drill here. We'll be very safe. It'll all be good. We're not going to spill anything. And then a month later, we spill. Oops, we're sorry. What does that do to the water quality, the marine life, the fish there, right? Another thing, you're going to go, you know, if you're going to fish, you're going to eat fish in this day and age, Please make certain that you know where it's from, because a lot of times you could be like, ooh, fresh fish, you know, caught wild off of New Orleans. I would need it. I would need it. You know, you are what you eat. And a lot of these things are, like I've said, one thing is related to another. All right. So at this point, if you are reaching for another bottle of scotch to help numb the pain, <laughs> um, are there solutions? Are there solutions in halting climate change? The good news is, yes, there are solutions. The even better news is that we can start as early as today. Now, whether that's going to happen or not is, you know, academic here. The first thing to note is that the United Nations has been leading the way in, if nothing else, raising awareness about the need to halt climate change. Okay. Um, beginning with the UN Conference on the Environment and Development in 1992 at Rio de Janeiro, uh, produced really the first modern um, international policy brief on addressing the impending climate crisis, the UN framework on climate change. And, you know, like all of these international policy conferences, they, they're very good at producing more future co uh, policy conferences. Uh, the Kyoto Protocols, uh, which, you know, went into effect in 2005, um, was one of the first big um, attempts at, you know, providing an international commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, again, this is little more than goals and aspirations that each state has to meet, right? The UN doesn't really have the authority to enforce all of this. But still, Right. Even after Kyoto, the Paris Climate Accords, which many critics will say fall short 
of what the scientists say has to be done is nevertheless, you know, a praised compromise, a praised agreement that all signatures of the, you know, of the of the agreement back in the day um, agreed to abide by. Um, and this was an agreement that worked to, you know, seek the prevention of climate change by more than two degrees Celsius. Okay. So the idea is to, you know, if the world's go, if the world's temperature is going to increase uh, by three degrees, four degrees, right? We need to make certain that we at least take two out of that by a certain point, and then an additional 1.5 out of that. It doesn't solve the problem, but it puts a significant amount of brakes on it. But again, Paris Climate Accords just simply have these lofty goals, but it's up to individual states to figure out how to do. Now, a smaller country like, you know, Slovakia or Serbia could be like, yeah, sure, there's no, there, there's really, it's, we can easily do this, right? A bigger country like the U.S. or Russia or China or India, which are big, big, big producers of carbon emissions, right? They constantly complain that that is going to put a major strain on their envir- on their economy, uh, on their infrastructure, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. But this is the whole idea, try to meet. Sad thing is that without the element of enforcement or punishment for failure to meet these objectives, a lot of these countries are just going to sign it, but not really do much. And that is because are there obstacles to halt in climate change? Yeah, the solutions can be found if we overcome the obstacles. And you know what? The biggest ones are individual states. Here are the main culprits right here. The US, China, India, Brazil, Russia. These are the three, five biggest ones. The five most polluting countries. Now, of that, the US and China are probably in the most egregious. But still, China, at this point, has overtaken the United States for the largest amount of carbon emissions emitted into the air. However, China is also undertaking a number of internal green policies that hopefully within the next five to 10 years will at worst cancel the carbon emissions and at best hope to reduce and eliminate. The United States is just one of those countries that honestly believes that environmental protection is just bad for business. And this is not a Republican thing. This is a Democrat thing as well. The Democrats will maybe talk a little bit more about the need to recycle, reuse, and uh, repeat, right? But at the end of the day, what ends up happening is that we, the consumer, are told, you know, eat less meat, um, you know, don't bring plastic bags to the supermarket and, uh, you know, separate glass, paper, and uh, plastic. When we can eliminate the worst effects of climate change today by holding a hundred global companies accountable and effectively saying under penalty of, you know, enormous fines, dismantlement, incarceration of your CEOs and stockholders, you need to get a hold on environmental protection. And these 100 companies, right, these 100 companies could effectively reduce all of the climate problems that we have today by 75%. So you and me deciding, hmm, I didn't throw that plastic bottle in the right can, not going to make an ounce of difference right? Not going to make an ounce of difference. But this is what, you know, the opposition from states that will make the argument that, you know, we're industrializing, we have to pollute, you know, you can't tell us to put a break on this when you're expected, uh, when we're expected to produce a certain amount of goods and services. You had your industrial revolution, we need to have ours as well. But beyond the individual states, okay, there's also limited capabilities of IGOs and NGOs, as I've been talking about in this lecture, they're really good at raising awareness and setting goal marks, but that's not enough, right? They're very good at saying what needs to be done, but they don't have the ability of implementing it. And if all that you do is create these nice little glossy, uh, color-laden billboards and brochures and web pages that inspire seventh graders at their science fair to recycle more, uh, I got news for you. You're really not all that effective, right? And I think one of the big issues here, you know, sort of moving into more of a, you know, concluding um, answer is that there is a number of conflicts in coordinating and leadership at the institutional level, 
right? Who designs, who implements, who's in charge, who does what, who holds who accountable? There's no real direction or engagement. The UN will say, we need to reduce climate um, uh, carbon emissions. We need to protect the environment. Great. How do you do that? You don't have the power. Do you coordinate with these local level um, organizations? Maybe you do. Where's the bureau, where does the bureaucratic red tape kind of you know hold things up here? And what this does, if anything, is tells us that the best way to tackle problems of climate change is to start at the local level, right? Look at Africa, or better yet, look at parts of Africa within the context of those environmental regional capabilities. Large scale directives and sweeping statements are for the most part useless. You can say whatever goals you want to be met at the Paris Climate Accords, but how do you get there, right? Even the Green New Deal that is sitting there waiting to be passed here in the United States can talk about becoming carbon neutral by 2030. How do you do that? And are you going to have a blanket policy uh, from California to uh, New Jersey? No. There's, you know, there's specific custom design ways in which you have to do this. And you can't be putting people out of business. You can't be, I'm sorry to say, you know, <clears throat> hurting the economy either. Otherwise, you're going to be met with, you know, a lot of obstacles. So within this discussion of addressing climate crisis, addressing the environment, right, we constantly use this term sustainable development uh, to such a degree that it's become, I think, cliched, right? We like the term sustainable development because it's positive, it's optimistic. But what exactly, you know, sort of is this, right? Sustainable development is a loosely based term that envisions, quote unquote, harmonizing economic development with environmental, social, cultural, and structural conditions instead of macro design directives. So just what I was talking about beforehand is that if you want to tackle the environment, you want to address the problems of climate change, sustainable development requires you to look at the institutional, the regional, and the, you know, and the structural capabilities of the area that you are assigned to. And this, at least in theory, right, at least in theory, and for the purposes of this class, it will take the direction of development out of the hands of technocrats, right, and place it into those that are involved in social work, public policy, and educational groups. Now, without looking at whether or not these local level groups are successful or not, okay, if you're one of those people that wants to go into the world and help protect the environment or uh, you know, make the area less polluted, make the land more arable, save the rainforests, whatever you need to do, right? We're looking at development without exploitation. We're looking at social democracy with free market enterprise. You know? So you know, in your weaker moments, you could say, well, how do we stop the logging of the rainforests in Brazil? Like, well, one way is you just send in the military and just arrest all the loggers, you know, shoot anybody with a chainsaw. Um, and if Bolsonaro sends in more people, just arrest or shoot, you know, more of them. The problem is that the loggers are oftentimes living on the edge of poverty. So what do you then do to um, mitigate the idea that a lot of the logging is not even done officially? It's just normal local people just go in and start chopping stuff down. What do you do to get them to not chop down trees? What do you do to get poachers to not kill elephants or rhinoceri? What do you do to get people to not burn down rainforests in Indonesia for palm oil? You know, you could just, yeah, you know, open fire on humanity. That's not going to work. Okay? You need to provide sustainable solutions that provide alternative policies for development, alternative policies for growth. If it's nothing more than just simply externally imposed economic demands, well, people will look for anything. You know, when you need cash fast, you know, you'll put anything on eBay. Um, and that's exactly what happens. So the importance of sustainable development calls for the role, the increased role of NGO activism and involvement. Greenpeace, Red Cross, 
Amnesty International, Human, you know, whatever it is that you want, a lo- World Wildlife Federation, right? These are all great, great organizations that sadly don't have enough of a voice on the global stage, especially when they're constantly going up against the World Bank. That doesn't give a damn. All they want is their palm oil. All they want, right, is their cheap meat, right? So in a way, NGOs, activist NGOs need further empowerment in order to actually do something good here. And what about, let's say, the United Nations or the European Union, right? Let's talk about some of the big ones, right? What can they do? And remember, in the beginning of this lecture, I said I'm going to be using these two as, you know, primary examples because they're pretty well known. And the UN is, you know, the big global organization, while the EU is a relatively successful regional one. The United Nations does have an environmental program, you know, UNEP, which, you know, if nothing else, um, is responsible for three things. The negotiation of international environmental agreements and the provision of oversight for the Secretariat. So the UN at least has the ability of coordinating and working with a number of lower level NGO and IGO organizations to at least provide information to the you know, UN Secretariat for information. The UN also monitors global environment changes and conditions. So, you know, they have a number of, um, you know, number crunchers, you know, think tanks. They do provide some good data um, on current environmental conditions, which are then forwarded on uh, to smaller organizations that can work with it. Usually this data is kind of depressing and rather sobering, but someone's got to do it. And then they oversee the so-called regional seas program to protect 13 regional seas. Now, you know, it is a way of providing some kind of, you know, protection for maritime wildlife, but the UN is, it's there. It doesn't have a lot of the clout that we would like, but it's got at least a few things. The European Union, on the other hand, is a bit more proactive. And that's because, if you remember from the EU section, they have a lot more ability at um, implementing and having a top-level oversight over policies. A lot of this stems from the enormous bureaucratic uh, department of the common agricultural policy. Um, And it's a little bit more on a practical day-to-day level here, right? So the European Union within the common agricultural policy sets standards and limits on the nature of agricultural production. So in other words, um, farmers across the EU right, have to meet certain regulations, have to meet certain standards on the use of pesticides, uh, the inclusion of preservatives, um, you know, in foods, uh, the nature and the type of animal rearing. So, you know, it's not going to be these horrible dystopian, you know, abattoirs that you'll find in the United States, which, again, I I, I hate looking at those videos. It's like, look, you're going to be in the meat producing business. You have certain health codes. You have certain regulations on what to feed them, um, what to, if anything, uh, put in the meat for preservation. And what's even more so is that the EU is a lot more adamant about upholding organic produce and farming. That's the reason why people in Europe just tend to, on a larger level, just eat healthier than the United States. You know, um, meat is not exactly as cheap as it is here. You go to the wall, you go to Walmart, you can get Tyson chicken. I wouldn't eat it. I have no idea what is the hormones, the biochemicals, the preservatives, the um, the um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here. The thing that you inject to um, kind of kill or nullify any disease in the animal from poor living conditions. I mean, this is the reason why people are so unhealthy and fat in this country. So the European Union has done a bit more in providing a higher standard, a higher quality of, you know, of meat. But beyond that, the common agricultural policy is connected to uh, larger and more serious investments in renewable energy in green architecture, right? This is definitely the case in like Germany and Denmark and the Netherlands where, you know, new apartment buildings, um, they have to run on certain amounts of solar energy. There has to be a lot of greenery, not just around the building, but in the building um, as well. Um, Energy uh, production is definitely in favor of wind and solar much more, much more than you would find um, in the United States. There are large parts of Germany that are completely 
energy self-sustaining on either solar or wind power alone. There is no need for fossil fuel, no need for oil, no need for natural gas. And then even within the automobile industry, um, emission standards are even higher than they are in the United States. Add to that um, a greater investment in public transportation over private vehicular traffic. So whether it's intercity or intracity buses, tramways, trains, all of them operating along, you know, elect you know, electricity or some hybrid format provides, you know, far more, you know, green energy and clean air um, in many of, you know, Western or Northwestern European uh, cities. Um, in addition to that, there is many, you know, many states are given the incentive to greenify right, public spaces and preserve natural wildlife areas, right? I talked before about Switzerland and, and Austria um, investing in their natural parks, their glacial lakes, their mountains, their hiking trails, um, things that are just left open for the public. No vehicular traffic at all. Switzerland, which is not an EU country, has five times the amount of hiking trails than they do, uh, you know, roads for cars, and this is just a big national pastime, is hiking and getting involved in nature. The, it doesn't take much, folks. It, you know, it doesn't take much to just simply care about the environment. But one needs to, I guess in the United States, turn it into something economically lucrative, I mean, I guess. But the EU, for all of its faults, right, does take, I would say, a very proactive role in providing for some type of sustainable, environmentally friendly development. And finally, still with me, <laughs> and finally, with all of that said, we turn to one final question, one final overarching question for this class, which basically ends where we began. What of the state, right? what role does the sovereign state play in such a complex, um, conflicting, confusing um, multilateral world today? Um, well, I guess the first thing to ask is what makes global governance today different from the last 150 to 200 plus years, right? What makes the international system today something completely new, um, unforeseen, um, and we're kind of, you know, entering and dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? The first is, as I have already said before, but it's worth repeating again, states and IGOs, international governing organizations, right, they're no longer the only important actors in the world. Um, when, this, when a class like this was taught, let's say, 50, 60 years ago, the you know, emphasis would have been only on states with the possible emergence of IGOs. Um, about 30 years ago, when you know I was you know high school entering college, um, it was states and IGOs alone. Oh, that was about it. The age of globalization, um, the proliferation of non-state actors, the explosion of things like the internet, social media, the idea that in 2001 the United States, the or for any country for that matter, for the first time I think ever, declared war not just on a non-state organization, but on a man, on an ideology, right? Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, Islamic fundamentalism, implies that the global arena today is much more crowded than we ever expected. Civil societies, NGOs, international advocacy groups, private companies, general social movements, they all influence global politics and international affairs. Um, the idea that, um, you know, a, a small regional war in one part of the world, if it happens to be volatile and important enough for natural resources, are going to infect the price of gas at my local gas station in about a week or so. Global governance today is messy. There's no other way around it. It's just messy. And as the textbook concludes, and I have to agree with KMS, there's no single model of global governance to fit all issues and policy problems. Now, that's the reason why we started this class out by examining all of these IR theories, right? It wasn't just meant to, you know, eat up time and introduce you to the field, but 
The reason why, year in and year out, we constantly talk about the different positions of realism, liberalism, constructivism, now once again, you know, making a comeback after 30 or so years, Marxism, um, all four of them um, give us insight into how the world works. And, you know, if I was to use my own, you know, biases here, I mean, I like to take the easy way out and say that I'm a constructivist. And that constructivism is the answer simply because constructivism just incorporates elements of realism, liberalism, and Marxism um, based on state perceptions. But if we also understand that every state has their unique way of looking at the world, and that will, you know, interact with and sometimes conflict with another state's interest, and then think about how states' interests are shaped by their involvement or lack thereof with international organizations, whether it's the UN or NATO or the EU or something else like that, right? We, you know, are sort of tempted to say, well, why even bother with theory? You know, just talk about, you know, things are. States just do certain things and just, you know, just keep up with current events by reading the, the New York Times or the BBC or the Guardian um, every day. I think that we stick with these theories because, at least as far as realism is concerned, one thing the realists will never be wrong on is that the primary actor of the international arena is and I think will be, to answer the, you know, the big question, where is the state, the state will still be the primary actor. The state will still be the most important actor. It is no longer the only actor, but the realists are correct on that. And depending on how states act, how states, um, you know, coordinate their decisions, um, yeah, they can adhere to liberalist principles of international law, human rights, uh, and a certain set of morals, right? Um, is it because they truly believe in these principles or they are upheld as a way of getting to an ulterior motive of enhancing their own self-interest, right? Marxism is, you know, surprisingly made a rather significant comeback in looking at the world today, especially when we examine um, the plight of countries beset by um, environmental challenges, um, exploited by globalization, beset by internal uh, state weaknesses, um, you can look at the world and you know, walk away convinced that any one of these theories uh, gives you an insight. But the fact that not one gives you an all-encompassing explanation means that, yes, global governance is unique and you know, quite messy. So, you know, with that said, some final questions to think about. What can global governance actors do? You know, knowing that global governance today is a cacophony of a whole bunch of actors and interests and organizations and sub-organizations, right? <clears throat> what can they do in 2020, 2021? Well, the first thing that they can do, especially if we're looking at the organizations rather than the states, is develop new ideas, right? If nothing else, if nothing else, international organizations like the UN have, you know, raised awareness for the importance of things like peacekeeping in previously war-torn areas, power sharing um, as a solution for protracted social conflict, right? We didn't really talk about uh, power sharing that much in this class because I don't want to get too much into conflict resolution, but, you know, upholding human rights, um, defending the autonomous rights and interests of minorities in countries today. These are things that no one considered doing even 30 or so years ago. You just left it up to the state itself to figure out what to do and hope that they got it right. In this day and age, we're like, eh, there's a chance you won't get it right. So we have to pressure you to do so. And we have to make it lucrative. Look, you know, don't drive your minorities into ethnic cleansing because that just makes you look bad on the global market. So new ideas are certainly part of that social constructivism that uh, I talked about in the beginning of this lecture. Global governance actors can also fill knowledge gaps and gather data, you know? We're at that level, you're at that global institutional level where you see the world, the entire world, as one 
laboratory. You're not beholden to research and propose policy um, in the name of one country's national interest. You know, so it's like if you decide to, you know, graduate from LIU and you like this stuff and you want to go into, I don't know, the U.S. State Department or you want to work at a U.S. think tank like uh, the Council on Foreign Relations or um, the U.S. Institute for Peace, you are going to look at the world, you are going to analyze the world through the lens of American national interest. And you may um, be pressured to change your policy recommendations, not for what's good for that part of the world, but for what's good for U.S. interests. If you work at the U.N., if you work at the EU, if you work for Amnesty International, if you work for Greenpeace or World Wildlife Fund or any of these, right? Your job is to think globally and implement globally. So your job in, you know, filling knowledge gaps and gathering data is truly transnational. You think beyond national borders. You think more regionally. You think more continentally. Um, and this is something that I think is sorely lacking uh, in the information age here, where every country wants to see the world through its own national lenses. Now, by filling in the gaps and gathering data, you will be able to set, promote, and monitor goals. So, for instance, something as lofty as the Millennium Developmental Goals that the UN has set up, um, they might be almost too lofty, but you know what? They provide a set of guiding principles that can influence, pressure, sometimes even coordinate states to augment their decision making that will be beneficial for, you know, reducing poverty, increasing literacy, treating women uh, with greater sets of dignity. Um, taking the environment into account, reducing child hunger or whatever it is, right? These are goals that are kind of like in the back of your head if you're a state leader and you want to be able to meet. Um, so global governance, you know, has that ability, as if I've been saying, you know, developing ideas and setting policies, setting agendas in the international arena, uh, particularly in direct coordination with regional organizations. So, you know, the European Union works quite well with the United Nations, right? The United Nations has these lofty goals and the EU says, okay, well, we've got 27 members with the additional possibility of at least five other countries uh, joining us. And, you know, if UK wants to get around to it, we'll happy to welcome them back in again. But we've got a regional um, geographically fixed area of meeting some of these millennium developmental goals, especially when it comes to adhering to environmental standards. We can do that. Right? We've got the ability, we've got the organizational wherewithal to make these things happen. Global governance actors oftentimes don't, but they should have the ability to adapt and reform. Um, again, adapting and reforming is something that we have looked at when we did the EU and even NATO. Um, regional Organizations have a better success pattern because they are not beholden to the, um, you know, pressures and structures of the rest of the world if they happen to only comprise a small number of members. Um, adapting and developing, evolving, is probably a better way of, of looking at it. Um, these things can happen. And even though there has been, you know, a constant lament at the UN for being just increasingly out of date, right? This is more so at the Security Council than anything else, right? We talked about how the Security Council still kind of represents the balance of power of 1945. But outside of that, the UN's role in global affairs has well, significantly increased. Um, not enough to get everybody optimistic, but the UN is mo moving slowly. Let's put it that way. Right? It's moving slowly. It's moving gradually. It's evolving. But, you know, we get to see a lot of this within ECOSOC, within the International Court of Justice, within the expanding roles of the Secretariat. Okay? Um, another more lofty, more conceptual ability that global governance actors can do is design new varieties of governance. Okay? And this is kind of an open-ended thing here, but 
You know, increasingly, here we are at the end of 2020, and we are noting the limits of the Westphalian state. The Westphalian state model, which has defined the nature, the um, capabilities, and the authority of states since, you know, 1648, or at least has set the mold in what states are. But as we've been talking about, states today are limited in their capabilities. And sometimes that limitation um, turns capabilities into liabilities, right? So maybe it's time, and this is a very metaphysical way of thinking about this, not saying that the state itself should wither away, but maybe there are other entities that may not ever become states in the formal sense, but should be considered and should be grouped in with international coordination for the sake of stability, regional stability, um, and harmonious growth. You know, that's why we spent all that time talking about parastates. You know, what to do with them? You know, what to do with Kosovo or nagorno karabakh or Taiwan um, or Western Sahara, you know? And yeah, I mean, the host state could invade, take over and call it a day, but that rarely happens. And even when um, it is invaded, like Karabakh was invaded by Azerbaijan about a month ago, um, you know, Russian peacekeepers are still keeping Karabakh on the map. And what to do with its final status? Will its rump be incorporated into Armenia? Will it be recognized as a state itself? Or could we just consider regional territorial entities to have some kind of limited but visible representation at the UN? You know? International actors give us the ability of thinking about this stuff. Right. And whether it's, you know, at academic conferences or, you know, books or written material, it shows that the international arena today is far from fixed and far from static. Right. It gives us ideas of thinking how to adapt to changing global circumstances. But before you run off and apply for a job at the U.N., you know, we need to also recognize what global governance actors can't do, right? What can't they do? What are they limited in doing? First and foremost, and this I've mentioned since day one, international organizations do not have mostly the power of enforcement. They can set policy, they can advise, they can recommend, but they don't have the ability of punishing um, defecting members. Um, even the UN can condemn, but what usually ends up happening? A strongly worded condemnation from the General Assembly or worse, the Security Council. Oh no, the, e, you know, the, you know, the UN is against this. Big deal. IOs can, um, in some cases, offer, you know, carrot and stick policies. The EU is good with this. Um, NATO, to a lesser extent, um, but the carrot and stick policies can only be believable if rewards and punishments will be given. So, you know, if a country like Serbia, you know, does a good job in meeting certain reform expectations, the carrot must come in the form of membership. It cannot just be then, you know, delayed uh, membership indefinitely. And if a country like Hungary, um, you know, continues to violate political rights and civil liberties, the EU needs to apply a stick. Or if Turkey continues to violate Greeks, uh, Greece's territorial waters in the Aegean or the Mediterranean, or doesn't relent on converting Hagia Sophia uh, into a mosque, NATO or the UN have to take punitive measures against the country, right? And this can be in the form of sanctions or, you know, what have you. Uh, but that's about it. Right. That is about it. At the end of the day, if you really want enforcement, you got to get another country to do the enforcing. Um, we've discussed over the weeks here that international organizations are also kind of bad at reacting quickly to a crisis. Right? <laughs> and I think that, you know, if you remember back from our discussion in the League of Nations, um, the League's inability at doing anything with Japan's invasion of Manchuria, or Italy's invasion of Ethiopia until it was already, you know, past the point of, you know, remedying. Um, 
is, you know, continues to be played out more recently. The UN, um, you know, was kind of stuck in figuring out what to do with the Yugoslav civil wars. Um, still does not really have any definitive position on the status of uh, Kosovo. Um, even the European Union can kind of drag its feet when they need to be a bit more proactive. And while this doesn't seem like it's that problematic, when states or even non-state actors are waiting for IOs to do something about something and they don't, well then credibility is lost and legitimacy is severely weakened. So global actors really, they don't really have the ability of reacting quickly. They're not like a state with coordinated, centralized decision-making. Um, one of the things that really grates on people is the inability of IOs to manage long-term projects on behalf of broad-based goals. Um, usually what ends up happening is one of two things. The project can continue on indefinitely. Some humanitarian involvement in some developing country. Um, but by year two or three, the original intentions of the goal um, become lost. And the UN department just becomes this corrupt, bloated, bureaucratic leech on the land. You know, the UN has notorious uh, cases of corruption when they seek to involve themselves in some initially lofty humanitarian purpose. So either the project continues at the expense of the goal, or the goals are kept, right? The people who are directing it still, you know, they believe in the cause, um, but it doesn't last long. Um, either the UN believes in its cause too much, or the project believes in its cause, and it sort of runs afoul of local officials who, you know, will vote to get them to pack up and, and leave. So the idea is that the UN has a very difficult time in maintaining its original purpose and doing something positive. There have been a lot of UN peacekeeping operations around the world that are now entering their 50th or their 55th year around, you know, Sinai, Cyprus, there's still UN uh, soldiers, peacekeepers, a few of them here or there, you know, in Bosnia and elsewhere. Um, are they doing anything? Right? Do they really do anything, or are they just kind of now just living off the land? Have they kind of gone native? The UN in particular, I know I'm picking on the UN here, but um, you know, IOs also have a difficult time coordinating activities with other agencies. You know, imagine one bureaucracy trying to cooperate with another bureaucracy. It, it just doesn't work. Right? Paperwork is lost. Chain of command gets contentious. Who runs what? I mean, let me introduce you to the wonderful, terrible job of ECOSOC. Right? You want to work in ECOSOC. You want to be like, I'm going to get my hands dirty. I'm going to you know, work on the ground. I'm going to provide economic and social development. Yeah. You spend more time coordinating meetings about having additional meetings than doing anything uh, tangible. So coordinating activities with other agencies is just a bureaucratic, paper-ridden nightmare. And finally, global governance actors really have a difficult time um, dealing with the internal problems of states. Um, and this kind of leads us to where we're going to be you know, heading in the final few minutes of this discussion here. But the UN knows that weak states are there and they just kind of look at them and they're like they scratch their heads all the time why is niger why is south sudan why is cameroon why is the central african republic why is somalia why is haiti uh so screwed up and you know they, they fail to also see that you know sovereignty both strong and weak create their own security dilemmas um, especially in an increasingly integrated um, and interdependent world. So, you know, there are capabilities and there are limitations to what IOs can do. And, you know, in, when we talk about sovereignty in that sense, right, let's, let's then focus on the white elephant in the room, the sovereign state. You know? Now, at least traditionally, when we talk about the Westphalian model of sovereignty, there's a couple of basic principles that go into, you know, understanding what a sovereign state is. A sovereign state is one with fixed borders. Um, sovereign states have the ability of regulating uh, revenue. So we're talking about, you know, taxing uh, their fellow citizens. They have a monopoly 
on internal security. So, you know, a security apparatus, a police, uh, you know, an army, a military, whatever. They have a central government that is involved with planning and coordinating all of this. And there is an international recognition that the state in question uh, possesses all of the above, right, by other states, by other organizations. Nothing new, nothing radical in this sense, right? The basic principles of sovereignty give a significant degree of power and authority over a governing body, the likes of which do not exist in international governing organizations. But over the past 30 to 40 plus years, this understanding of sovereignty has been significantly eroded, especially in light of global capitalism, especially in light of now regional identities um, becoming more and more apparent <clears throat> in which multi-ethnic states possess populations that look to neighboring countries as their kin groups, right? So the sovereignty of states which would otherwise imply one to think that there is a complete control not only over the borders, but over the people that live in those states um, are becoming unraveled, right? And we see this with the disintegration of Yugoslavia, the former Soviet Union, wars in the Caucasus, trans-border conflicts in Africa, um, especially when transnational organizations kind of, you know, get their foot in, um, whether it's the World Bank or the IMF, um, the European Union that are pushing, that's pushing for a greater community of European states. Um, you know, sovereign authority now has to share uh, the playground with a whole bunch of other authorities that don't supersede sovereign government, but certainly complicate their ability at making, you know, decision making, at, at making decisions here. Right? And of course, when one state somehow weakens, um, you know, internal conflicts happen to erupt a restless minority, um, irredentist movement, some militant organization threatens the regional stability of an area. This isn't any more relegated to one country. This will spill over into you know, other areas, uh, especially when these threats come from emerging global terrorist organizations. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Al-Qaeda, right? It could be Boko Haram. It can be Ansar al-Din. It can be the Islamic State. Um, it can even be um, nationally oriented militant organizations that form these partnerships and alliance with other organizations around the world um, in some form of solidarity. Um, even more so today is the fact that there are some sovereign countries that will effectively hire um, a number of these militant groups and, you know, farm them out as mercenary soldiers. Turkey has done this now, um, you know, after their, um, you know, um, foray into Syria, they are, or they have used um, Syrian terrorists to tilt the balance in Azerbaijan um, against Armenia. And I read in the paper about a day or two ago that they're now allegedly gearing up to send some more of these militants into Pakistan uh, to take control over the disputed territories in Kashmir. Now, I will pay good money to watch, you know, Turkey get pummeled by India, you know, from a safe distance, but you kind of see, right? This now is one state can use non-state actors to screw around in the internal affairs of another country. So the sovereignty of states is no longer as guaranteed as we would like to think, you know, within the textbook. And what is the relationship of the states to international organizations? Now, at the end of the day, to answer this question, what will happen to the state? I have said already, the state is not going away. The state will remain um, a primary actor in the international arena for a couple of simple reasons. Um, states retain the ability of making or breaking international agreements and consensus. They also have the power, as I've said, to contribute to the legitimacy of international organizations and the power and the decision making to execute those policies. So just by that alone, states will act to subordinate international organizations to their own levels of decision making. But even beyond that, 
states pursue, states possess abilities that organiz, that international organizations do not. First of all, they have the you know they are the primary actors in revenue and security, right? States have the power to tax and they have the power to secure. There is no international organization that does it. The UN doesn't tax. All right, the EU might tax, but that's just part of your membership fees. NATO doesn't tax. No other organizations do that. And by doing so, right, states create a number of symbols of identity that people still will look to. Flags, emblems, histories, right? We might be more and more global today. But as I like to just colloquially ask my students every time I teach this class, we have yet to get to a point where there is somebody that will take a bullet for the United Nations, right? There is no one will take a bullet for the European Union. People will take a bullet for their country. They'll take a bullet for their homeland and they will sacrifice for their homeland. There is still a, a sense of national identity and national patriotism. We have not gotten to the point where people identify as world citizens. I mean, that's lofty, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Not only that, but states will continue to provide the physical geography for international organizations. So, you know, as international as cities like New York and London and Brussels and Strasbourg and, you know, Vienna and Kenya and um, you get the idea, right? Nairobi, I'm sorry, right? They're all still located in individual countries, right? The UN headquarters is not located technically on international territory. It's located in the city of New York, right? So even there, right, the state will remain this overtly, obviously visible actor that has a significant amount of influence in global policy. Um, you, know, po you know, significance that allows and, and that relies on states, you know, investment of these organizations to continue to work and function, okay? I mean, look, we've looked at the European Union. So by way of concluding what has already been more than two hours, and I really hope that you have started, uh, that you've been listening to this in bits and pieces, okay? Um, I, I know that this, is, this has been long. This is one whopper of a, uh, of a video, but I promise we are entering into the last 10 minutes here. The challenges... Uh, for the future of international organizations, you know, in 2020 and beyond, um, you know, rest on a number of open-ended issues. Um, the legitimacy of IOs, I mean, they exist, but what's their purpose? What is their role? What, what, what is their primary objective in international policy today? And the challenge of legitimacy is that they have to do more than just simply raise awareness. It's, it, it's good, but people are increasingly looking to organizations like the United Nations to kind of act as this overarching moral organization that has the attention and the resources to address problems, crises, and issues that um, go beyond any one country. This is related to both accountability as well as effectiveness. You know, when we talk about accountability, we ask, well, who is accountable to whom, for what, and by what mechanism? All right. What is the pecking order in global governance today? States may still be um, a major actor, but do they drive international policy or do international organizations set international policy for states to then decide, right? So even though, you know, st elected state leaders can claim that no one is above them except their own constitutional law, um, organizations like the UN, the EU, um, and others, need to show effectiveness in not just, as I've said, um, raising awareness, but actually getting states, getting regions to act on things like environmental problems, like global inequality, economic inequality, right? Like, um, you know, tackling 
issues of human rights violations, like, you know, finally paying attention to millions of migrants who have fled their homeland due to war, famine, terrorism, and try to repatriate them. You know, do all of these Syrians that have left Syria and fled into Europe, I mean, do they want to go home? I bet you they all do, but is there anything for them to return home to? So what do we do in terms of rebuilding Syria? What do we do in terms of making certain that they have a secure life to return to, right? And this you know, leads to the final challenge of leadership. Well, I mean, they're all kind of related here, but all right, who is going to lead the charge? Who is going to be the shaper of international policy in the next few years and decades? Um, Will international leadership supersede the state? Or, in order to answer all of these issues, is it really a question of, <clears throat> we need to bring the state back in? If states have been, in sort of, if state powers have been eroded <clears throat> to such a degree that they become economically impoverished um, and unable to meet the problems and challenges caused by global warming, climate change, international terrorism, and what have you, do we then empower the state once again? And along that way, do we look to certain countries um, to lead the way? You know, currently, let's, let, let's look at our cast of characters in a multipolar world, right? What role will the United States play? Um, and how much of a role will they play? Will they continue to advocate for policies of transnational economic neoliberalism, right? Will they still adhere to the idea that, um, you know, capitalism, the market, econ you know, market economies will bring forward modernization and democracy? The problem with that today is that they are facing two big challengers, China and Russia. China's policy is pretty simple. China is, you need money, um, we'll, you know, we'll take over your construction projects. Russia and we don't really talk much about Russia exerting a role on the international stage foreign policy wise. But if the United States engages in, um, you know, transnational multilateralism, Russia is a big proponent of sovereign democracy. Russia is a big proponent of in order to tackle all of the internal problems of your state, your state's institutions, your state's constitutional order needs to be invigorated needs to be strengthened, needs to be cemented. That's why Vladimir Putin loves to work with these top-heavy executive leaders. Um, some of them might be friendly, some of them might be rivalrous, but he works quite well with people like Xi Jinping, Recep Erdogan, and to a lesser extent, Donald Trump. Russia's whole um, idea with Syria is that Syria should not be held victim to U.S. intervention because of look, look at what the United States did with Iraq. Look at what they've done with Afghanistan. Look what they did to Libya. We're not going to let that happen to Syria. So the best way to build Syria up, the best way to um, ensure security is to work with the legitimate political institutions of the country and not engage in regime change. This has actually been so far quite effective in cementing Russia's influence within the Middle East, a region that has been quite tired of America's policy of topple the dictator and put in somebody that's more pro-Washington than anybody else. And what about the European Union, right? The European Union um, still has, you know, some work to do in integrating the rest of the Balkans uh, into its membership, deciding whether or not to extend membership to Ukraine and Georgia and maybe Armenia and what to work on with Russia. But in all of this, we're pointing out that states have greater resources, greater leverage, greater capabilities in reaching a conclusion, in reaching an agreement than international organizations do. International organizations kind of provides the paperwork and maybe the letterhead, but it's the state that can create peace or unravel it within these regions. And I guess as a final piece of discussion, and we have reached the end, <laughs> finally, of this talk and uh, information with this lecture, um, I think it's worth 
remembering that there is today no single state or international actor that will dominate or provide overarching leadership similar to the bipolar Cold War era of the second half of the 20th century. So in other words, what we have grown to learn and what we have grown to get used to in international studies is gone. Okay? There is a new world order, there is a new set of powers, and there are a new set of diplomatic parameters that we better get our hands around and figure out what they are uh, before we, the United States, are playing catch-up. And that is because leadership today will come from many sources, right? both state and non-state. Um, there is still, I will say, a comparative importance of the sovereign state. And there still will be places for people like the U.S. president, the Russian president, the German chancellor, the Chinese party secretary to exert significant influence uh, and ideas around the world. But they, as I've been saying, are also sharing the podium. They're sharing conferences. They're sharing uh, meetings and symposiums with NGOs and other advocacy groups, with public and private partnerships, with corporations, with religious groups. Um, you want to talk about the environment. Um, the Pope, the Ecumenical Patriarch, and the Dalai Lama have been outspoken proponents of environmental preservation. In fact, before Pope Francis uh, was, you know, lauded for speaking out on behalf of the environment, the current patriarch of Constantinople, the effective leader of the Orthodox Church, sort of like the, the Pope of the East, right, ever, um, he's been patriarch since the early 1990s. Um, he has been known as the Green Patriarch, who has gone on record to say that polluting the environment is a sin. It is an absolute sin to the planets. Um, and religious figures like him and the Dalai Lama um, get a lot of credibility for raising awareness for environmental protection. And finally, private individuals, whether we like them or not. Um, you know, in this day and age, the super rich like the Jeff Bezoses, the Elon Musks, I'm sorry to say, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, um, you know, these are people who have the money to buy their voices to be heard at economic forums, at humanitarian conferences, at the United Nations, you know, as well. So we are entering, we are entering at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, um, if we're not already in, an age of multipolar multilateralism, right? Uh, a multipolar world that will most likely be contentious because the global powers do not all share the same type of political ideology. So the multilateral agreements may be contentious, may be conflicting, but given the crises that we face today, particularly when it comes to the environment and climate change, it must ultimately be cooperative if current transnational challenges and threats are to be properly addressed and solutions are to be found. So what is the role of the state, especially when we think about problems like the environment? The state needs to coordinate with other states on how to make climate address an international issue. That involves the United States working with Russia, with China, with India, with Brazil, with the idea that we cannot just simply harmonize economies, but we need to abide by loftier non-economic principles set forth by the UN, by Greenpeace, the World Wildlife Federation, in placing sustainable development over bottom line profit. And if that means harnessing global capital to social democracy and a change in the way in which energy is consumed, then it is going to be costly. It is going to involve as many people as possible to make that transition. But if we are to be a sustainable functioning world, not just by 2050, but by 2030, we need to get on this stuff now. Now, this may be, you know, a daunting challenge 
but no one ever said international studies wouldn't be messy. That's the nature of multipolarism. That's where we are today. No one ever said this stuff was going to be easy. No one ever said it wasn't going to be problematic and messy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to a definitive end for this class. I know that this was a long lecture, but I wanted to compile it all together in one big review session, which I'm hoping that you are listening to and taking notes in order to maximize your abilities to do as good as possible on this final paper. There is a reading evaluation, a final reading evaluation that is still due, and that is at the end, uh, that's at the beginning of next week. I will have the questions and the due date up on Blackboard. From here on out, we are meeting as a group in workshop, putting together your final papers, and addressing any final questions and concerns or issues that we would like to talk about in hopes of getting your head around a lot of these complex topics. But other than that, I want to say for the first time, and it won't be the last before mid-December, it has been an absolute pleasure working with you, for some of you working with you on more than one occasion, and for a few of you working with you for the first time. I hope you enjoyed this class. I hope that it wasn't too complicated, given the nature and the unorthodox structure of this semester. And those of you that are interested in taking on these tasks one step further, I welcome you to take the course with me on the UN next semester. Many of you have already enrolled, but I would love each and every one of you to continue working with me. All right, with that said, everyone, have a great night. I will see you in a couple of days. I will look forward to seeing you all uh, on Zoom. Take care.